to biohybrid synapses. How electronics can be used to mimic the biology in our brain. Francesca Santoro, Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia. On November the 9th, 1989, I was a three-year-old kid living in the south of Italy. My parents often discussed that life-changing historical moment with me, the moment that had reunited countries. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, the jury, for, for this great opportunity that they give me to, to present my work and the work of my research team here. So I guess by now, my age got spoiled, because as the video mentioned, I was three years old in 1989, so this, making the math very straight, makes it 35 today. So although um, I'm 35 years old, I still feel quite young, and I'm actually one of those persons that really thinks a lot about the future. So how is going to be the world in 30 years from now? Think about three things. They make you think what's going to be in 2050. These are my three picks. The first one, I'm really a big fan of Back to the Future movie, and I really hope we're going to have those flying cars and flying highways. The second pick is that I'm pretty sure we're going to still talk about climate change a lot. And last but not least, healthcare is going to be still quite a burden in our society. In 30 years' time, I'm going to be part of the aging population that is going to turn 60s. And with the aging population, all those diseases that are related to biological degeneration are going to be so much present and affecting our lives. Well, among those, the diseases and pathologies that really hit the neural and the nervous system are going to be really still a big challenge in our society to be cured. Well, I'm very much interested in uh, helping and you know, give my um, background to serve the research and help in discovering how we can fight this in the future. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm actually an electrical engineer and really try to uh, develop, together with my research team in Naples, in the south of Italy, tools and platforms based on electronic engineer that can really be interfaced with the brain. It can really reveal and give insights on how the brain works and how neurodegenerative uh, processes can be limited. Well, this is quite straightforward because the cells in our brain, the neurons, do communicate to each other through electricity. Well, that's in this exact moment, how our neurons are fighting very uh, small and quick electrical pulses, and all this are, you know, making our neuronal network in the brain processing information. Well, although we have billions of neurons, and we have actually very important contact points within the brain that are responsible for the information to get through, those are called synapses. And the synapse is what we call a pseudo-contact point between two neuronal cells, where the first neuron, the presynaptic one, is having the first you know, uh, action potential, this very fast uh, electrical pulse. And when it reaches the end of the neuron, this makes the release happening of those neurotransmitters, those molecules, which then reach the second neuronal cell, the postsynaptic one, and then by receptors that bind, so some proteins that bind those neurotransmitters, cascade of events is generated, and in the end, another action potential, another electrical pulse goes through the second neuron. Well, so how, how can electrical engineer help with decoding these kind of signals or even restore this electrical activity by sending externally some electrical pulses when, you know, this synaptic connection is not functional? Well, 
We just heard about transistors, and transistors are really the elemental units in electrical engineering. They're beautiful components, and you have them in your smartphones and in your laptop. And what you see here in this scanning electron micrograph was one of the first attempts to couple the elemental electrical engineering unit with our brain unit, the neuron. And so we could really, in this case, and this opened up a huge uh, range of applications into what that now is so-called the bioelectronics research field, and we could really monitor the electrical activity of a neuronal cell, and even simulate it. Although this was a great success, there are some limitations in the use of these devices when it comes to couple them to neuronal cells. Well, the first one is that those devices are made of conventional metals and semiconductors and oxide. They're very rigid, they're very flat, as you can see. Well, you know, we're not flat. Our cells are not flat, are not rigid. They are very soft, they are very three-dimensional, they are dynamic, and they really have lots of protrusions into all dimensions. Well, so now we really try to design a new electronics that could overcome those limitations and really try to make biomimetic electronic devices that would act on two main things. The first thing is that we want to make electronics that looks like neuron, and the second one, we want to make electronics that thinks and acts like neuronal cells. And that's how we tried to answer the first uh, point. And so the first question was, like, can we really do uh, electronics and design materials that look like neuronal cells? And that's how we uh, managed to do this. We created those nanopillars, protrusions from the surface of the chip, which look like those spines that we have in the brain. And the cells turn out to really like those. They kind of hug them. They really try to wrap around so closely. And we were so interested in understanding how close they would get that we even develop a microscopy tool that could really give us an idea of the distance. So how close this tight junction was um, happening. And so what you see here is really a 3D reconstruction of uh, a cell environment and along with uh, uh, a nanoelectrode, what you see in, uh, in gray. And all these brighter spots around it are the cell organelles, including the membrane of the cell. It was the one responsible for really hugging around the structure. Well, in order really to uh, complete our task, and other than going for the full architectural design of this electronics that would really uh, seamlessly embedding together with the neuronal networks, now we really had to task to have further engineering of the materials in two aspects. We really need materials now that can conform to the brain and conform to the curvature of biological system, as well as really resemble intrinsically neuronal functionalities. And this is why we came up with using so-called conductive polymers. So when you think about polymers, I guess usually you are more familiar with the electric things that are made for isolating, right? Well, we can really engineer those materials, we say we, we can dope those materials with other molecules in order to conduct electricity. Well, those are very beautiful materials because in yellow you see an example of a conductive polymer and when a voltage is applied and we are in an electrolyte environment, cut ions, so uh, positive ions from the electrolyte can move towards the bulk of the conductive polymer. Well, those, this, is a, this is a very specific feature of these materials, despite the conventional semiconductors, which are only sensitive to electrons. And those materials, actually, when are in presence of cations, can really make, in the bulk, electrons to move and thus generate an electrical current. Well, now, let's think that instead of having an electrolyte, 
we're gonna have a biological synapse, so a presynaptic biological neuron that is releasing neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters can impact and, let's say, achieve the end of the postsynaptic one, which is now a conductive polymer. And this is how we actually build the first biohybrid synapse. So we had a, a primary neuronal cells at the presynaptic end, which was releasing spontaneously one specific neurotransmitter only, the dopamine. You might be familiar with the fact that when you eat chocolate, you do release a lot of dopamine. And so you, you, we can make great biohybrid synapses with that. And so when the dopamine is released, we can transform it by a process, which is so-called oxidative process. And so cations are then produced, and they are proportional to the amount of dopamine that has been released by the biological neuron. Cations reach then the artificial, the conductive polymer end, which is now our artificial neuron, a neuromorphic device, a transistor. And so the more the dopamine from the biological presynaptic end is released, the more the postsynaptic artificial one is going to remember it, is going to have memory of it, because it's like being imprinted into its bulk. Well, now this was a, a great achievement, which we did in collaboration with groups from Stanford University and the Technical University of Eindhoven. And this was the very first building block, which is giving us the gears to develop the next generation of biohybrid neuronal networks. Well, what we want to really do in the end is something like replacing and recreating lots of connections, like the billions of biological connections that we have in our brain. Our aim is really in order to recreate a full functional memory that really is able in a biohybrid way to recapitulate some, let's say, uh, cognitive processes is kind of making a biohybrid microprocessor. So what is this then good for? Well, in this case, we can really take use, make use of those platforms for different kinds of applications. The first one is that those biohybrid neuronal networks can really act and behave like completely biological ones. We can use them as drug screening for a lot of uh, pathologies of the nervous system. We can really in the future use those biohybrid neuronal networks to restore lost functionalities in several uh, areas of the brain which have been damaged. So now, given that we, have, we, we know about this uh, technology and the fact that we can really recapitulate both the structure, the face, the shapes of neuronal cells along with their operation. And these are really, these two can really be merged together to develop new platforms which could now be used for the cure of diseases related to aging, like the neurodegenerative diseases. So I asked you three things in the beginning that you would think when you think about the 2050. Now I'm asking you to do the same again, given the technology that I just described to you. And now, when I think about 2050, and I think about the beauty of this platform, I can really see how electrical engineering, along with biology and medicine, can give us the tools to have effective platforms, customizable platforms to the physiological needs, and in the end, just platforms that would be human. Thank you.